Hello everyone, my guest today is Mark Smokler. He's founded six companies, two of which have been acquired and three of which are market leaders in their respective spaces. The leading brick and mortar retail analytics company, idealspot.com, a leading online retailer, sakesocial.com, and a cutting edge marketing services platform, written.com. Mark's companies have generated over $300 million in lifetime revenues and sold over 150,000 products worldwide. Mark, are you ready to take us to the top? Yep, I hope so. All right, so you've, you're doing so much. The challenge is I have to figure out one of these things to focus on. So let's do it this way. Which one's making the most money top line? Ideal spot, sake social, or written? Well, it's sake social. So we oh, good. sell uh, yeah, Japanese sake online. Um, so we're the largest uh, online retailer of Japanese sake. Um, but no, I mean, ideal spot is the one that's rocking and rolling right now. And that's where I spend most of my time. Okay, let's focus on that. But I, I'm curious now that I know it's sake. How much do you sell annually in Japanese sake online? Well, a lot. I mean, on a daily basis. Um, so we use Shopify on the front end. I'm a big fan of Shopify. Um, and uh, essentially every day we sell thousands of dollars worth of sake all across the United States. Now, there's some states that are obviously dry that we can't ship to. Um, but, but again, I mean, we, we ship to most states and it's all outsourced. I have no employees. Um, we have a third party, uh, warehouse in Napa Valley, um, that pick, picks, packs and ships all of our brews. And, uh, again, Shopify in the front end and it's just, um, yeah, just a fully automated business. So it's that's, a really fun business. That's great. So a couple thousand a month, so minimum 365 grand a year. Have you got, I mean, do you do a mil- more than a million a year there? We do not do a million, more okay. than a million dollars a year. Yeah. So between yeah. 365 and a million, but no touch. No touch. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's just a, you know. It, it's, it was a hobby business that became something more and interesting. Um, and again, it's not that I'm a, you know, a big drinker of sake. It's just, you know, an opportunity that I saw. And that's a sort of a long winded story in and of itself. Um, but again, I mean, you know, if I just had, you know, five of those, I'd be, I'd be happy, right? Fully yep. automated businesses that just sort of print money on their own. So. Yep. Okay. Let's talk about ideal spot. Uh, what's it do and when did you launch it? Yeah, so we launched, uh, so the platform that's live today, we launched roughly, uh, geez, uh, September of 16. So what is that, 15, 16 months ago. Um, and we essentially help everybody within commercial real estate, uh, including retail, restaurants, et cetera, better understand their local retail markets. And we do that through the use of what we call better data. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if you call it retail as it was, was focused very much on the identity, right? What people look like. Um, sort of age, ethnicity, et cetera, we focus more on intent, right? So people signaling that, hey, you know, I want a cup of coffee, right? And so when and where is that happening and helping sort of the the coffee shops, um, the brokers, developers, everybody sort of within this retail ecosystem better understand where that demand is for that cup of coffee. Now, your, yeah, your algorithm is only as good as the inputs that you put into it. So you spend a lot of time trying to probably fine tune inputs. What inputs are you using to make these recommendations? Sure. So we have all the, the standard stuff that you would think of, right? We have all the census data, right? So the, the demographics, again, what people look like, right? We also have uh, spending by retail uh, category. Um, psychographics, all of the basics. We also have uh, really good traffic data. So the movement of a local population. Like actual physical traffic from a DMV about cars passing this intersection per day. Yeah, we actually partnered up with a company called Inrix uh, that maps and models all of the traffic across you know, the United States. They're well known for it. I would call them market leaders and we buy that spell data. Spell them, them, spell that name. Inrix, I-N-R-I-X.com. Got it. And so they're tracking hundreds of millions of vehicles from their navigation systems to partnerships with BMW and Ford and all of those. So they buy all that data and then we buy it from them, sort of democratize it to our clients. Um, and the same thing with our, with our demographic data. We partnered up with a few companies to get that data. And so again, I mean, we don't add value there, right? That's just sort of we're aggregating that data that's already been aggregated for us. Um, where we cut our teeth is basically... Uh, so the demand side data, that purchase intent data is ours. We've been building up that model for over two years now, and we're pulling that from search and social networks. Um, and we're marrying that to identity. So we're taking the what people are, and we're marrying it to sort of the who people are, right? So I'm a 41-year-old uh, white guy from Austin, Texas, right? And so retailers make tons of assumptions based on what I am, but they wouldn't, they don't know who I am. For instance, they don't know that I'm a vegan, that 
I suck at golf, right? I'm not a fan of yoga, et cetera. That's who I am, but you wouldn't get that from my identity. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to peel back a layer and try to help people better understand. You use social to get those other data points. Well, actually search and social. Search is more active intent. That's somebody raising their hand saying, I want a cup of coffee uh, near me where I'm at right now. And that could be from them typing into Google Maps. Uh, so how do you know that though? That's my question. Like, how do, do you have a partnership with Google where you know what they're searching location wise on their phone and you tie that back to the demo data? Well, that is a long story in and of itself. And that's some of our secret sauce, but most anybody right now can go onto Google trends and they can type in coffee in a specific area, uh, over a specific time. And Google will tell you the average amount of searches that happen for that keyword. Now, it's not just, you know, coffee, but it's 800 related cousins where it's, you know, roasted and, you know, uh, you know, bulletproof coffee, all of those things aggregate up. So we aggregate all those up and then we, and then Google will tell you, of course, from a citywide level, same with Facebook, they'll tell you from a citywide level what the reach estimate is for a category. But of course we take that down from the city level to the street level, right? So we chop yeah. that all the way down. And yeah, again, I mean, because if you think about it, um, sorry, if you think about it from retailers perspective, um, you know, if you were to tell, you know, an online, you know, company, Hey, Austin has a hundred thousand searches for golf and, you know, golf related term, that's fine for them, right? Because it's just an online advertising campaign. But when you're talking about a location that matters, right? Is that, is that, you know, aggregation, North, South, East, West, where are those people? Where is that density? And we help them sort of locate that. So they make a better decision. And who, and who is they? I mean, is it Starbucks? They're trying to open a store in Austin. They want to know where they want your recommendation on which intersection to open it at. Yeah. So we don't work with Starbucks today. Not but yet. is that an example? <laughs> yeah, that's an example. And so if you think about it, um, you know, again, you know, we can now help augment whatever Starbucks is doing. We can tell them, Hey, we definitively know there were whatever, a hundred thousand people that were searching for coffee, uh, within a five minute drive time of this ad. Oh, and by the way, there's no coffee shops within that five minute drive time. So we call that a market opportunity. Yep. That's unmet demand. And we can definitively tell that. What's your revenue model, SaaS or is it something else? Um, so it's SaaS today. Um, and, but again, people can come on and I mean, it's SaaS with no commitment, right? So you can come on and you can cancel at any time. But we, you know, people subscribe and that gives them the ability to pull reports, map, uh, whatever it is that they need. And what are they paying on average per month? Are we talking 100 bucks, 1,000, a million, 10,000? Um, no, I wish a million. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we started a hundred dollars today for just a basic report. Uh, and we scale up from there. What I would say is our average take right now per client is anywhere from 500 to a thousand dollars per month. Yep. And it really depends on what they want. Right. Um, and so if they want all you can eat, uh, today that's, you know, you know, $2,500 for them to basically pull all you can eat reports, maps, models, full access to our data. And are you selling the utility metric you're selling around is what based off like line of data or like what, what are those? Is it, you know what I'm saying? Like, is it, is it data records? What's that number? Uh, I mean, are you, I'm sorry, what are you asking? Well, so I'm, I'm asking how, 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 yeah, no, no, not the deliverable. When someone starts at a hundred dollar plan, what utility based pricing metrics are enabling you and your sales team to upsell them to a 500 or two grand per month plan? Is it additional feature sets, additional lines of data records, additional contacts? What is it? Yeah. So today we're a seed stage company. And so right now at this point, it's all about getting people sort of using the service, trying it, um, getting to appreciate it and find the value in the service. Um, I don't think seed stage companies can really get that discerning when it comes to their features. I think it's just right now a prove it point or trying to find product market fit. Um, so that's basically the stage that we're at. We're just pushing all of our chips on the table um, and we're trying to get as much feedback as we can and getting people to say what they like, what they don't like and what we're missing. And so we're just basically tossing everything right now. And it's just really about how many reports they want right now, how much yeah. access do they want, but we're giving them everything uh, right now. And we're not starting to chop that up in sort of a Chinese menu. I'm asking this because like a company like Clearbit, as they matured, they move from a model like what you, you have currently, you know, one ideal spot report for a hundred bucks a month, five for a thousand. Clearbit moved to basically, it is like a buffet and you pay per scoop, you pay per API call essentially. And it's now it's obviously cents on the dollar, but I'm curious if you eventually yeah. plan to move to that kind of model. You know, look, um, you know, I'm a huge fan of sort of letting the, the, the market guide us on a lot of these things. Um, and it's really what my customers will bear. Um, do they expect to purchase, you know, at a report base? And we're finding that people are, our client base is a little bit more, um, 
they're sort of they're more old school if you want to call it right so they're thinking of uh, you know a report i want a report i want something tangible right and i want my report to share it to either get an sba loan or i want to give it to my broker even if it's the broker trying to you know lease the space or the developer trying to get financing whatever it might be they need that report so you know chopping things up um is sort of not something that i think will work today in our marketplace um but who knows yeah, look, it only works. I mean, Clearbit works because they're not selling to the person that needs the report. They're selling to the technical team that builds the integration that is constantly yeah. pinging the API. I mean, your thing, I mean, when I think about the use cases you just gave, I'd say, man, that's hard to build a SaaS business around that because these reports are one-time events. I mean, mm -hmm. or do you have people that have to come back over and over and over and over week after week, month after month? Well, yeah, I mean, so this is this is an interesting thing, right? So to find a good location or to get the right tenant, um, you have to pull multiple reports and look at multiple locations and look at multiple types of retail uh, categories. And so, but Mark, once you find back, that tenant, though, isn't it done? No, I mean, because I mean, things change. And so even from the demand point, let's say that there's a huge spike in demand. And we've had this conversation with um, a number of grocery chains, et cetera. And so if we track over time demand, let's say there's a spike in demand for whatever, tires, right? That's an opportunity for them to go into market and run a promotion and try to bring in that demand into that store. And so things are always changing in the retail market and giving them the ability to be more reactive to what's happening is what we are hoping to do more and more of, right? So call it Google Alerts for your retail location. And so again, you sort of have to look past this you know, just, you know, about site selection or getting a retailer in the spot. Okay. How do you get them to evolve? How do you get them to be more, um, open or available to the changing retail market that they live in? Does that make sense? It does. What do you got now? You obviously just launched, right? So you're still learning here, but what do you got today in terms of total customers? So we have over 10,000 uh, registered users on our platform and they have plotted over 500,000 locations ready on our platform. And we're adding about another thousand plus per month. Um, and so we're, and, and that's inbound. And so we're having to basically turn off that funnel uh, about a little bit after lunch, just because we don't want the wheels to fall off. But um, as you can imagine, the real estate space and data, they're both combining to make a pretty large fertile environment. For Mark, us. what's the customer number though? I know 10,000 sounds better users, but what's the customer number? Um, how many people are paying per month? Correct. Um, we're closing in at about a hundred. Okay. That's, I mean, that's pretty healthy on, on that amount of folks. And it's, I mean, it's not a cheap price point either. So, I mean, are you putting touch on these sales with your team size today? Uh, we're just 10 people. 10, just how many of them are sales? Uh, so right now, two of them are still not including myself. Okay. Everyone based in Austin. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Good. I mean, and then in terms of size, I mean, I can basically take a hundred customers times a minimum $500 ARPU. You guys are doing North of 50 grand a month. Uh, yeah, we're doing higher than that. Yeah. yeah. So we're on our way to the 1 million era. Oh, that's good. Do you think you, do you think you'll break that in like Q1 this year? That's 88 grand a month. Uh, that's the plan. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I'm, I don't, I don't know if that's the end of your 2018 goal or end of Q1 2018 goal. I'm curious. <laughs> um, let's just, you know, conservatively speaking, let's just say we'll get there in the next six months. That's pretty good. Now, can you give me a sense of growth? So if you go back now, this would have been early days, right? So if you go back to the end of 2016, what were you doing? 10, 20 grand a month? No, I mean, we were just kicking off, right? Getting our sea legs. Um, I want to say that we were doing five. Yeah, I mean, we were doing 5K. Um, December was a big blip just because people were trying to blow through their budgets. Um, but January, I mean, it was more normal around five to 10K until we started hitting our stride more as we started to understand a little bit more of how to sell price points, et cetera. That's great. Look, that's good. 5X in year over year is pretty good. If you can do that another year, you're, you're sitting on a rocket ship. So, uh, God, I hope so what's your churn and how are you managing that? Um, you know, so again, churn, I mean, we're not requiring people to stay on a subscription. Um, I'm not a fan of that. You should, you know, the value should be there to keep people on without locking people into contracts. Um, you know, the churn in terms of people subscribing versus doing one off. No, no, just if I mean, you have a hundred, if you have a hundred customers in month one, how many leave in month two? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not, I don't have a good estimate to that right now. Have you lost uh, any customers? Yeah. I mean, people come on and off all the time, right? Um, you know, a customer, let's say they have five locations. 
They just need, you know, a month of reports or two months and then they're off and we're perfectly fine with that. Are we talking like 50 people leave in month two, like 50% monthly churn or 10% or? Uh, I would say it's probably around 20%. 20%. Okay. So pretty high for a SaaS business. Like, so what's your goal? Do you want to go into the like one-time yeah. report side or if not, how do you drive down churn? No, no, no. Again, I want, I want to be clear. I mean, you know, from the SaaS perspective, as you define it, um, you know, we are a subscription service, um, but we also have the ability, if you go to our pricing page today, you can buy one-off reports, yeah. right? And so we're trying to sort of bridge, bridge this gap, gap, gap of, you know, how do you want to interact with us and who are you as a customer? It's the same product. It's just a question of how much do you need? Um, and so, you know, as we say, like the SaaS product in terms of people subscribing, I mean, again, these are the types of people that have a lot of locations or they're a brokerage firm and they need a lot of access to data. Um, and again, the people that are doing the one-offs or subscribing for one or two months, it's just really hard to look at is churn a bad sort of view of the business, or is it just that's the type of customers and that's how they want to take the product. And again, I'm not trying to, I mean, it's all revenue to me. Right. And so, yeah, no, I mean, you're, look, you're, off? you're still experimenting. I mean, look, one of the things that confused me when my team is doing research for this interview is your, your first plan is it basically comes out to a hundred bucks a report while well, your next plan, which is five, you know, it's a grand a month. It's comes out to 200 a report. The two additional check boxes for that are basically professional services, a dedicated account manager and a team training session, which tells me like you're trying to figure out how to onboard people at a higher price point, which you have to charge because you have to pay someone to do the onboarding and the training. Yeah. And, and again, we're experimenting through all that pricing, right? And so we're running that pricing, that $100 price point right now. Um, I mean, it used to be $300. And so it's, again, it's, these are the things that you go through in a seed stage company, right? Yeah. I mean, it, from our perspective, I mean, we have, you know, we have a lot of top line inbound demand where people are signing up and they're hungry for data. It's just us trying to figure out the best way to interact with them and sell them products. And again, it goes one of two ways. I don't, I don't know how, how deep you went into it, but um, when somebody signs up, they either want a touch point, so they schedule a demo, uh, they call us, they reach out on chat, et cetera. And so they go through our sales team. And then the other side of the funnel is self-service, right? And so, you know, we're exceptional at obviously the sales touch point side, uh, but on the self-service side, I mean, that's, that's a much more difficult, you know, not to crack, especially for a B2B, for somebody to be able to understand enough, see the value enough, and commit money uh, for a service that, you know, they're just learning. Yep. So. How are you acquiring these customers? What's your CAC today? So it's mostly PPC. Um, we're now starting to do a little bit of Twitter. We tried Facebook. Uh, we were not successful on Facebook um, for a myriad of reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, we're so, just now trying. Yep. So in PPC, how much are you spending to acquire a customer? Um, we are spending about 15 grand total a month all in. Um, and that's spread between right now, remarketing, uh, Google, Bing, um, uh, and a little bit of Twitter. So, I mean, what I would say is not that much. I mean, if you look back at my days at Finality, I mean, we were spending, you know, hundred grand a month on PPC. So oh, yeah, but Mark, it all comes back down to CAC. So for that 15 grand, how many new customers will that drive? Um, so again, uh, if we're, you know, bringing in at about a thousand. So yeah, we're about anywhere between 15 to $18 customer acquisition costs from a uh, sign up in terms of sale. Uh, I don't have the exact. Number well, how many, how many signups do you, well, you said you had 10,000 and then a hundred of them have converted to a paying customer. So you need about, you need about a hundred signups to get one new customer. So take 15 to 18 bucks times a thousand. You can basically back into it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I mean, look, it works because your price point, your price point. Well, I don't know. This is, you're figuring it all out. That's the beautiful part about where you guys are right now as a business. Have you bootstrapped this or have you raised? No, we've raised. So we've raised to date two and a half million um, in seed capital. Who'd you um, raise from out of curiosity? Yeah. So mix of people. So we did ATX seed um, was a big chunk here in Austin, Texas. Um, we also uh, got some capital from seed case um, over there at revolution. Um, uh, capital factory in town here, put in some capital. Um, we had some individuals that were previously customers. So, um, you know, some retail shops, some money from uh, individuals at CBRE, Newmark, Rub Night, Frank, et cetera. So we had a pretty good list of investors that are also potential channels, clients, et cetera. That's great. Makes a lot of sense, Mark. Let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, uh, what business book or, uh, or any book are you reading right now? 
Um, I actually read <laughs> fiction to give my mind a break <laughs> off of business. Um, yeah, I mean, again, I. Uh, what's your favorite? Of of, what's your favorite business book, kind of of all time? I don't know. Jeez, uh, I'm so bad at that. Don't um, make it up. I mean, if you don't read don't, business books, it's fine. No, I mean, I, I, you know, don't sweat the small stuff is a pretty interesting book for me. Mm-hmm. Number number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying right now? I'm not. No. Number three, what's your favorite online tool? Online tool. Um, uh, oof, I don't know. I use a lot of Google Analytics. Um, so looking at a lot of the data. Um, I use Intercom a lot. We use that for our chat program. And so we use a lot of their tagging. Um, they have some good analytics in there as well. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Three to five. Three to five hours of sleep. You can survive on f- five hours of sleep. Yeah, we have a lot of coffee. Jeez Louise. <laughs> What's your situation? Married, single, do you have kids? Married, uh, two kids. Wow. And, and, and how old uh, are you, Mark? How old am I? Yeah. 41. Man, that's impressive. Okay. Last question. Take us back 21 years. What do you wish your 20 year old self knew? Oh, Jesus. Um, I don't know, just not have so much of a fear of failure. Um, I mean, we have all this thing where, you know, everything needs to be, you know, great and we need to just, you know, be awesome at everything, but it just doesn't work like that. And, and I know I'm not trying to be sort of cheesy and I know a lot of people have said this, but I, in most cases, I mean, I've learned more from my failures than I have from my wins. Um, and I've had my fair share of both. And, uh, and again, I mean, it's just made me who I am today. And, um, yeah, so. There you, there you guys have it from Mark. One day, many years ago, he was drinking too much sake from one of his companies. And then he said, hell, I'm going to make this thing called Ideal Spot and start selling this data, launch the company back in 2015. Uh, it really allows you to go in there and buy a report, especially brick and mortar brands, grocery chains, things like this. Every business has an ideal location. They help you find that. Uh, he's raised two and a half million bucks to help grow the company. His team of 10 is based here all in Austin. Uh, back a year ago, they were doing about 10 grand a month in revenue at a max. And they're now up well north of 50 grand, trying to pass that beautiful $1 million AR mark in the first six months here of 2018. Healthy economics, trying to figure out how to bring down churn and experimenting with pricing. Mark, thank you so much for taking us to the top. Appreciate it. Have a good day.